All right, well, good evening. Um, I, I like a, a show of hands, too. Uh, who has been here before? That's it. Wow. Oh, yeah. So, y'all have heard the jokes before, y'all have not. So, uh, there are uh, new pictures. New pictures? Yeah. Yeah, I have changed the slides a, a bit over the last 10, 15 years, and we've been doing this many, many years. And, and I say it every every time, but I mean it every time. This is one of my favorite things to do. Uh, I, I was in the courtroom this morning in Tulsa. I half my practice is in, in a courtroom. The other half is, uh, it seems like, meeting with board members, meeting with individuals, meeting with real estate developers, attending a lot of HOA meetings, um, and, and kind of like Patrick, uh, who, by the way, is an invaluable resource. If you all have banking uh, or lending questions in the HOA area, uh, condo area, he's the guy to talk to. Okay. Um, but like him for banking, this is what I do. Uh, don't do criminal law, can't dispo your DUI or public intox, sorry. Uh, but I, I can answer uh, a lot of HOA and condo questions. And, and I like this area of practice because it actually gives me a sense of, of helping others build community and uh, learning how to treat neighbors the way they want to be treated and all of that. It's a very satisfying practice. Uh, this is a very uh, broad practice. It implicates constitutional law, contract law, definitely property law, corporate law, uh, not much criminal law, but every now and then. Um, so it, it, it's a broad spectrum, and there is no possible way we could cover it all tonight and then again follow up next week, which by the way, if you're, if you're not aware, this is part one, next week is part two. And so we'll, we'll skim the surface tonight on a number of topics and then we'll follow up next week with uh, a few more topics. We'll try to keep it to um, an hour and a half tonight. In fact, I'm a lawyer, I've got to give the disclaimer of course. So. I will do my best to answer questions tonight. That is the purpose, is to have a conversation. It's, there's a, a number of things that I want to make sure you guys hear and leave with, uh, with clarity and an understanding, but then if you're like me, you come to these things and you've got a specific situation, how do we deal with that one person? And there's always that one person in the neighborhood. And we can talk about that. Sometimes I can't get into too much detail. If you try to uh, ask me a question about it, uh, existing client of mine and get a leg up. Uh, I'm not going to answer those questions uh, because of conflict of interest and stuff like that. I'm not giving any legal advice tonight. And so if you sh hold up your bylaws and say it says right here, I'm not going to answer the question, okay? Uh, the only time I take a client is with a, a written engagement agreement. This isn't a, a, a big ad for my firm. I've got plenty of business. This is for us, uh, not, not just for me to tell you what the law says in certain instances, but also for y'all to hear the dialogue. And two, to understand the, the things that you're suffering from as a board member, and I kind of assume we're all board members here. Uh, there might be an individual member. Uh, don't raise your hand at this point. Um, but it's, it's to understand that you're all kind of in the same boat and you're not experiencing anything that, uh, that others haven't. And that's to say you're, you're not alone and there's a, a shared resource out there. And this is, uh, this, this is hopefully uh, to that end. So <clears throat> starting with the basics. In Patrick's uh, presentation, there were a couple of slides that talked about state law, and uh, if you've looked, Oklahoma doesn't have a whole lot of state law. We'll, we'll cover a, a slide in just a second that goes over each of the sections for HOA and condo law, and there's just not much of it in Oklahoma. Um, but I like to start with the very basics, and that's how these organizations, how these, these communities start and they start with uh, some documents. And here's a list of the most common documents that you'll come across in a community association setting. Now I'm gonna go ahead and, and jump forward because um, I wanna use this as our Uh, I'll just 
I'm, I'm just going to erase this. If you like me, sometimes pictures help. So in, in the development process, and uh, I know one person raised their hand and said that they have a voluntary association. Uh, one of those questions that comes along is, well, do I have to pay my dues or not? And that's just a variant of, do I have a mandatory association or do we have a voluntary association? And, and that question get an gets answered. Uh, a number of questions like, where do we find our covenants? Why is it that I have to do this? And we're going to go through the development process very quickly and it answers a number of those questions. And hopefully we'll, we'll put name to document and, and kind of bring all of this together so that we're all starting on the same page with terminology and process. So uh, I'll pretend that I'm a real estate developer. I've got an 80, uh, a section, or a, a, a um, uh, we'll say a quarter section, 160, and um, I want to cut it up. I, I have this dream of a community. I want to sell some houses. And so what I do is I will file oftentimes what's called a plat. Now, I, I could get legal descriptions and I could sell property without a plat, but most commonly when we have a community association, what we'll find is a plat, all right? So the plat, that's a picture of a plat, by the way. The plat is what allows us to call places on earth lots and blocks. Uh, if you have a set of covenants that refers to lots and blocks, but you don't have a plat, you may have a real big problem. And that's not uncommon to find in Logan County, uh, in Canadian County sometimes. There were a number of developers that uh, routinely would file covenants that referred to the plat and lots and blocks. And then you go, okay, well, it says plat and lots and blocks, so let's go find the plat, and lo and behold, there is none. Well, that's just a screw up. And so then we have to deal with, okay, what do we do in that instance? And that's a special problem. But when we file the plat, and the, the plat gets filed at the county clerk's office, that's what allows us to refer to lot one, lot two, and happy acres or you know, black acre. This is, um, this is our actually a replat of the lakes at Bridgewater. It's up off Kelly in, in Edmond. So we file the plat, and then almost immediately what they'll file is something that we typically will call a declaration, but it doesn't matter if they're called CCRs, and sometimes you'll see that referred to, or you'll see covenants referred to as CCRs, that's just an abbreviation for covenants, conditions, and restrictions, okay? Sometimes it'll be referred to as an owner's certificate. Is there anybody from Tulsa County from that side of the state? Not typically, but sometimes we'll have folks travel. They do things a little bit differently in Tulsa County and on the eastern side. I don't know why, but if you're over there, oftentimes the declaration or the covenants are actually attached to the plat. Have you seen this for your clients out there? It, it's, it's very strange. Um, but. That's how they do it. So oftentimes though, you'll have the plat and then the covenants are filed right after. Now the covenant is the document or the declaration is a document that says what you can and can't do with your property. Whether you have to get architectural or design review committee approval for that nice new sunroom you wanna build or the swimming pool. Can you put a basketball goal in your front yard? Can I paint my house pink? There was that, that case uh, we saw the picture of down in Texas. Um, can I use my house for short-term rentals like Airbnb? That is a big, big deal right now. We're doing a lot of Airbnb covenants. <laughs> We're doing a lot of uh, Airbnb litigation. So uh, the covenants tell us whether you can do that or not. This also gets filed in the county clerk's office. If the covenants do not get filed in the county clerk's office, they don't apply. They, they, unless there are some very limited circumstances. If I sign off on these and they don't get filed, they'll be binding on me, but they won't be binding on my property. So this is a very specific process. We do it every single time the same way so that we answer the questions. 
where is the lot and block that we reference in our covenants? Do these give people notice? Meaning when I buy my property, are they on record? Do I have the opportunity to find out what the covenants are? Yes, because they're, they're filed. Do they tell me what I can and can't do? Yes. Do they mention an association? Yes, if we have a mandatory association. By the way, oftentimes, oftentimes there will be two pages to a plat. The picture that you see there is often page two. Page one, there'll be language here, uh, there'll be some signature blocks here, and then a bunch of seals. Often right here, that's uh, dedication language. And if our question is, do we have public or private streets? Do we have a mandatory association? Oftentimes that will tell us here. Sometimes it will tell us down here, and I know you can't read this, but uh, that says notes. And oftentimes there's plat notes. And this plat note says the common area shall be maintained by a property owners association consisting of the lot owners. Well, that gives the world notice, because it's on the plat and the plat gets filed, that there is a property owners association, and it tells us who the members are. It's the people who own all the lots. The plat also tells us where the common area is, and this, this association or this neighborhood has very extensive common area. You, you might be able to read that, but that says common area. Yeah, that's most common. That's not always. Uh, Say that again? It'll have it in there all the time, or? If there is, uh, um, it'll have this. Yeah. Um, if the plat is in Oklahoma City, if it's in a major uh, municipality, it will have a plat note uh, that okay, says that. Doesn't have to. I've seen it, but my eyes weren't good enough to read it. So. Yeah. Um, but oftentimes, whether it's the picture or this page, there will be some reference to private streets, common area, property owners association. But if there's not, uh, and there is going to be private street maintenance, um, common area maintenance, and a mandatory association it has to be in the covenants. Okay, yes ma'am. Um, is it required that when a party puts a contract in on a residence or a, that the, is it a requirement in the state of Oklahoma that the CCRs, the declarations, et cetera, be provided to the buyer prior to closing? It is now. It was not for many, many years. Okay. And whose responsibility does that lie? It's the, uh, the seller's responsibility. Okay. Yeah. Uh, chapter and verse, if you want to look that up, if you... And, and by the way, that's for a, we're gonna call them single family developments, okay? So we'll divide the world into, the community association world into two categories. We've got condos, which in Oklahoma, uh, it, it's not called a condo, it's called a unit ownership estate, which sounds really silly, so we just call them condos. And then over here you have, sometimes people say PUDs, I'm not using that, for, that phrase because that's confusing. A PUD is actually a zoning document. It has nothing to do with really what we're talking about tonight. So we'll just talk about single family or HOAs, okay? That's, that's our universe tonight, condos and HOAs. So um, for HOAs, we've got Title 60, and that's OS. 857. I think it's 857. Is it in your slides? I know you usually have them in your slides. It is 857. They, our legislature do, adopted this, this silly flag act, and our flag is not silly. The fact that they adopted this statute is silly because it had been federal law for many years. And then our legislature was like, hey, let's pla pass a flag act like it wasn't already protected at the state level. Uh, so that, that's what I couldn't remember. I, uh, and the flag act is uh, uh, 858. <coughs> So anyway, if you go look up 857, that will tell you in an HOA context, the seller has to provide it. And it was only recently amended to require it. it. For years, what it said was, if a buyer asks for them, then the seller has to provide it within 30 days of closing, which is asinine. You already closed. Oh yeah, are there, are there covenants? And the, the thing here is, <clears throat> You, you may have heard of the, the phrase caveat emptor, the buyer beware. 
that doesn't exactly apply, but the, the idea still does in Oklahoma for, for buying condos and buying homeowners associations we're, it, within homeowners associations. So we're getting there, but if you move from a state like Colorado, Texas, Florida, California, uh, your buying experience in Oklahoma and the information that is pushed to you, you know, you've got push information and pull information, the, the information that is pushed to you is very, very different than what you get in a state like Texas, Florida, Colorado, and that's because they have much more comprehensive laws. This is a golden opportunity for your association, whether it's a condo or an HOA, to provide customer service to the people buying into your neighborhood. It's not just, hey, uh, there are no dues owed at closing, you know, the closing letter that your treasurer sends over, that your manager sends over. This is an opportunity to provide the buyer much more information than what you have to. And that's, that's really what customer service is, is going beyond either what they expect or the minimum of, of what they, they deserve or, or you're required to provide. You know, putting, putting a happy, uh, friendly, uh, informative face on your association and we'll talk more about this later because it comes into play with collections and enforcement yes ma'am so even though they're filed a record the seller still has to provide the copy to that's exactly right yeah and that's the difference between push and pull I get it. I mean, if they're big enough to buy uh, real estate, they should be big enough to know that, well, there's something out there that you need to do or you need to know about. But if we can avoid attorney's fees on a collections case or if we can avoid attorney's fees on sending a demand letter to tear down that, that basketball goal by simply providing, pushing that information first, that is something your association absolutely wants to do. Okay, um, and that, somebody said my name. Yes, ma'am. Um, does the state of Oklahoma require that you also provide the budget? Um, no, the state of Oklahoma does not. There are, well, I'll just say Norman. Norman is different. They have an ordinance that in a residential homeowners association, uh, I guess it's arguable whether it applies to a condo, uh, there is a laundry list of information. But so, so if you buy property, I'm going to use Texas as an example because I'm familiar with that one, you're going to get a copy of the insurance policy. You're going to get a statement of the extent of common areas that the association owns. You're going to get a copy of the budget profit and loss, balance sheet. Um, you're gonna get a copy of the reserve study? Probably. I, I don't know if it's required by law, but you're, if they have one, you're probably gonna get it. And then a copy of the covenants. Um, so you get this huge packet and you pay for it. You know, the, the transfer fees are, are much more extensive. But they just put that in your hand, and then you have a several days under Texas law to decide do you want to continue with the contract or not. That's something that your association can provide, and you don't need a state law to tell you to do it. Right now, what we get is you get a disclosure statement. It's going to disclose whether or not there's an association and what the assessments are. It, I believe it says something about the common areas and um, you're going to get a copy of the covenants. But, and that's all the, the law requires you. Yes, ma'am. Is it sufficient to post it on a website <coughs> that they have a, them access to it? Tell them you go to www. That is a good question. Um, personally, I, th I think that is sufficient. The issue there is some management companies will reproduce them by retyping them and some people, some treasurers, secretaries, associations will retype them. Uh, I think that should be avoided. Particularly in Oklahoma County, Tulsa County, Canadian County, virtually every county that I know of around here, you can go online and get an actual copy. You don't have to go get a, a certified copy, but you can get a, an actual image. It's going to say unofficial across it, but it's the same thing you'd get from the county clerk's office and put that on the website. 
that's a great idea. That's a real easy way to, uh, to provide access to those documents to people at, and avoid the, the copying charges. You can email them, fax if people still fax. Uh, okay, so the very basics for creating the community association, if you're a homeowners association, looks like this may not have that, has to have that, and if we're talking about a condominium association, you probably won't have a plat, you, will absol you absolutely have to have a declaration, and then there will also be bylaws filed for a condo. Now, I make it a practice, if I'm doing an HOA, I attach the bylaws as an exhibit to the declaration just for the purpose that we're talking about. There are certain things that we do as lawyers, there are certain things that we do in business that take people's arguments away so that we don't have to spend time on reinventing the wheel. We can foresee certain things happening. And so if we can foresee those things, those questions, those bad things, or just things that waste time, we, we try to avoid them. And one of the things that we can foresee coming up is, well, the bylaws don't apply to me because they're not filed of record. Well, that, that's not technically true, but we're just gonna skip that argument and we'll just file them of record. Well, I didn't get a copy of the bylaws, so they don't apply to me. Um, uh, okay, well, uh, they do, but we're going to skip that and we'll just file it of record. In a condominium, they have to be filed of record. It's an invalid condo if the, if the bylaws are not filed. So here we have, this is the, the real estate side of our community associations. And then we also have, we'll call it the corporate side. And on the corporate side, we typically will have articles of incorporation filed with the Secretary of State. Now this is the State Sec Secretary of State, not the Federal Secretary of State. And Oklahoma Secretary of State is where we file to create all of our business entities. Uh, you can have an HOA or a condo association that is an LLC, and I, I have seen that before. Uh, I don't think that's the best vehicle for your corporate entity uh, for an HOA or a condo, but there's nothing in the law that says your, your association has to be one entity or another. There's nothing in the law that says your entity or your HOA or condo has to even be an entity. So if our world looks like this, developer files a plat, creates a declaration that says, whether it's on the plat or the declaration, all the members or all the, the persons who hold title to a lot shall be a member of the association, shall pay dues and all of that stuff. That's creation language. You have a mandatory association at that point and it's unincorporated, meaning all of the members are personally liable for all the debts and liabilities of the, the uh, association. The absolute worst form of doing business there is. Okay? There's a reason why you know, roofers use entities, why the company you work for that you started, and why your lawyer told you or your accountant told you this is what you're going to do. It's creating an entity and we do the same thing for our homeowners and our condo associations. Right? Typically what we'll create is an INC, a C Corp. And we'll create a non-stock, non-profit corporation. Not a tax-exempt entity, that's a, a federal designation, that's a letter you get from the IRS after you go through a certain approval process. That's not what we're talking about tonight. Okay? We're talking about an Oklahoma incorporated uh, C-Corp that is non-stock, non-profit. And Patrick touched on this in, in um, uh, his talk. You do hear this every now and then. Well, because we're a nonprofit, we have to distribute all the profits. No, there's nothing that says uh, you have to do that. And in fact, that, that's a horrible business plan. Uh, or, well, we can only, we can't have any money in the bank. Uh, in our general operating account. We either have to spend it or move it to a savings account. No, there's, there's nothing uh, that says you have to do that, all right? 
Um, under the INC on the corporate side, uh, we might have <coughs> minutes, uh, both board minutes and regular meeting minutes, and then we'll have resolutions. And so our, our world, whether it's HOA or condo, is broken into a real estate side, corporate side. And courts have, have had a difficult time because we've, we have very old principles, legal principles, dealing with property. Uh, dirt's been around for a long time. It's been bought and sold for, uh, for thousands of years. Very established principles. But then when you introduce these corporations and managing the association that holds title to common areas and these interrelated uh, neighbor type relationships, the courts have said, well, we're not going to treat these exactly like contracts. We're not going to treat these covenants exactly like real property interests. We're going we're to treat them a little bit differently. And you see sometimes in the, the court rulings, courts struggling with, all right, I know this is what the contract says. The contract says you can't have a sunroom on the side of your house. And when I say contract, I'm talking about the covenants. All right. Sometimes you'll, you'll see that referred to as the contract. It's the, the thing that everyone has signed on for, uh, even if they actually haven't read them when they buy their property. <clears throat> but if the covenants say no sunroom, Covenants likely also say uh, the, the association or any owner bound by the covenants may seek uh, an injunction or a remedy at law in the enforcement clause of the covenants. What that means is the association or an owner can go to court and ask the judge to tear that thing down. So it's not uncommon in enforcement cases, and we'll talk about covenant enforcement uh, later on in, in these, uh, these seminars, but it's very difficult for judges to see, okay, I see black and white language and it's not, it's not ambiguous. There's no question what it says, but should we tear this thing down? And of course, the association or the owner who's the plaintiff is like, well, yeah, what are, what are the, good, the covenants good for if you're not going to enforce them? And that's what you, and I, I do hear that and I do understand that, but what a court's struggling with is this, this balance of equities, right? Can, can, we, can we give money to someone that would satisfy as opposed to tearing this thing down? And a lot of times that's what a judge is, is going to struggle with in an, a covenant enforcement case. All right, so this gets us to creation, and now we're off and rolling, all right? Uh, I'm not going to talk about developer transition to a resident owner. If you have a specific question about that, uh, maybe at the end, if we have some more time, we can cover it. But uh, most of the life of the association is going to be spent in probably where you are and that's the ongoing operation. Developers out of the picture and we're figuring out how do we run this thing? How do we foster community? How do we interpret this document that was dropped in our laps and now is our rules for the road? Okay, and so that's that's the uh, the rest of, of our discussion. After Let's talk about real quickly, and I'm not going to go into real in depth about any cases, but I do want you to know where the law is and how to find it. <clears throat> the law is not necessarily what you read on the internet. I, I know you know that, um, but don't tell me that. <laughs> but, but sometimes we forget that. Uh, sometimes we'll read a, a blog from an attorney in Broken Arrow uh, and just because they have a, a physical address and it says lawyer, uh, you think, well, that's what the law is. Uh, but if that lawyer is telling you, well, you can file a lien as an HOA, but you can't foreclose it, that lawyer doesn't know what they're talking about. That is absolutely not the law. And so uh, in Oklahoma, you can read the law for yourself. It's not complicated. In fact, our Condo Act was passed in the 60s. It hasn't matured. It hasn't been amended or updated. It's been there for years and hasn't changed. It's a very old condo act. And you're going to find it at 60 OS 501. Now, that may look like gibberish to you. That's actually an, an 
address. Just like web addresses, so here's, here's a web address. We all know you can use the Google or uh, type, type, it in, type the URL in and, and find the address yourself. Law has an address just like that. So if you go to this address, uh, OSCN.net is Oklahoma State Courts Network, and that's the, um, uh, the, the state-provided state, um, access to the law. All of the court dockets, uh, all of the cases, uh, your neighbor's divorce, all of that stuff, you can look it all up, it's all public record. Okay? It, you also have access to all of the cases and all of the legislation, all the statutes. So if you go to this, what will come up is a little dialogue box in the upper left hand corner and you, will, you can type 60 space OS, if you want to put the periods you can. I'm going to start doing a dance here in a second. <laughs> Uh, then space 501 and what that will do is that will take you to the Oklahoma Unit Ownership Estate Act and that's our Condo Act. At sec I do this every time. Um, there's a typo and I'll show it to you. That period. Et is, is actually its own word. It's not an abbreviation. So eventually, maybe in the next decade, I'll get to correcting my typos. Um, EDSEC just means ongoing, and that the uh, Condo Act goes for about 30 more sections. If you want to look at the HOA Act, it's not, and, and again, you're not going to find this, this language, this Condo Act and HOA Act. That's just short form because that's how we broke our, our discussion into uh, two hemispheres. So. The HOA Act is actually called the Real Estate Development Act, and if you're a single family development, then that's what applies. Let's go ahead and cover how you know whether you're a condo or an HOA. And the best way to do that is skip the plat, because if you're a condo, you probably don't have one, and go to your declaration. And as you start reading, the way these are typically set up, there'll be a heading, and it'll be probably in bold letters and it'll say uh, the declaration for Happy Acres to Oklahoma County, uh, State of Oklahoma. It might go ahead and say something about a unit ownership estate and if it does, you're a condo. If you keep reading and you get to the bottom and it doesn't say anything about condominium, it doesn't talk about general common elements, limited common elements, unit, uh, if it talks about lots and blocks and common areas as opposed to common elements, you're probably an HOA and not a condo. Okay? So that's uh, the Condo Act, the HOA Act. In Title 18, by the way, I don't think I said this, so this is the title, OS is Oklahoma Statutes, and this is the specific statute number. Uh, title 18 is where our corporation code is. There's some very important language uh, for you to know as a board member if your association is incorporated. And if I didn't mention it or stress it before, I'll go ahead and do it now. If you leave here and you know your association isn't incorporated, uh, you can do so. You don't have to wait till the morning and you shouldn't wait till the morning. You can incorporate it tonight online with the Oklahoma Secretary of State's website. It is that important to do. Don't, uh, uh, don't operate your association or virtually any business as an unincorporated association. You want it incorporated. All right. We're going to skip that. Let's talk about, and I'm, I'm not going to read these to you. These uh, slides are going to be available to you. But there are some basic things, and by the way, as we go along, uh, as you've been doing, if there's questions, just raise your hand and, and holler at me and we'll cover them, okay? Uh, but there are certain things that I want you to know about meetings and, and how to properly record them. So, um, along the lines of, of providing customer service, but also uh, avoiding the conversations that 
we'll, we'll just keep calling them that person, that one person likes to have. Uh, that person likes to word whip board members and hold the bylaws and quote chapter and verse and you know, but, 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 I'm not paying my dues because you didn't have the board meeting or the annual meeting on the, uh, the second Tuesday of December. Oh, okay, uh, that, that really has nothing to do with anything, but okay. Um, if you're a board member, you, you don't need to know them backwards and forwards, but you do need to have read them and know what your responsibilities are and what, what the goals are of the association. You can't simply uh, ignore the language in your... Uh, in your bylaws because it's inconvenient and one of the things that you're looking for as a board member is the word shall versus may <clears throat> and so where you're gonna see this is uh, there'll be language more than likely that says the association shall maintain the common areas or the common elements and what your bylaws or your declaration is saying is it's non-discretionary. The, the purpose, one of the main purposes of the association is to maintain the common area or the common elements. And so oftentimes attorneys, myself, we draft shall. Now, if, if something is discretionary, so the association board may borrow funds. You would never write it, the association shall borrow funds. That doesn't make sense, but you want to make it discretionary. So, non-discretionary, have to, discretionary, could choose to. All right. So as you read through your copy, if you're a board member, take a highlighter or circle the shalls and keep a you know, pretty good working knowledge of that because those are the non-negotiables, those are the non-delegables. Right? Those are the things that the board has to do. We're going to talk about amendments later, um, but one of the things that it's possible you're going to come across is uh, language that says shall that makes it impossible. But that, that um, performance, you know, um, following that shall, discharging that shall is impossible. I'll give you an example. So there are, uh, there are condominium associations and maybe some homeowner associations in Oklahoma where they have bylaw, and I keep using this term bylaw intentionally because I am talking about bylaws. Let's not get our, our words confused. A declaration, covenants, owner certificate, those are the structural and use restrictions. Bylaws typically deal with the business of the business. How do we get notice of meetings? How do we conduct meetings? How do we elect board members? How do we throw board members off the board? What rights do I have as a member of the corporation? Those are typically bylaws. There are some really poor forms of bylaws out there that say on an annual basis the association shall obtain a certified audit. Well, back when those bylaws were adopted, certified audits didn't cost what they cost today. And I have association clients whose budget's $15,000, little 10 unit condos, and they go get a, a quote for a certified audit and it's five grand or, or eight grand. And they're thinking, the well, lawyer said shall means we, we don't have a choice. And the accountant said they're gonna charge us five or eight grand for a certified audit. Uh, what do you do in that situation? And, and I'm not going to answer that question for you. That, that, that one's a cliffhanger. We'll, we'll answer that uh, when we get to amending documents. But knowing your, um, your bylaws is, is very important. Part of that is knowing when to meet. And even if the bylaws typically will say uh, the, the board shall meet uh, at, at least on a quarterly basis, that's a pretty common bylaw provision. The board really should meet more than that. And really the board needs to meet as often as it can competently keep a handle on the business of the association, and that's typically monthly. Right? And so what are you doing at these monthly board meetings? You're looking at reconciled bank statements. Uh, we need to get a date. Do we have a date for the embezzlement class again? Are we doing that? 
year. Not this year. All right. Well, the reconciled bank statements uh, reminded me. Uh, so Patrick and I did a, a an embezzlement <laughs> course. It was a one night deal a couple years ago, or was it last year? Uh, if. It, we, we're going to disagree perhaps on on this, but if I had to name one thing that was uh, the 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 best, it's not the only, but the sil and it's not a silver bullet, but one of the best ways to avoid embezzlement is to have board members, plural, look at reconciled bank statements on a monthly basis, and then also know what you're looking at. You know. <coughs> Hey Matt, treasurer, why all these um, notations for cash? And then you look at the, the check and it's made out to cash, it's signed by me, and it's endorsed by me. You know, hey, where'd the cash go? Um, sometimes it's not very sophisticated. Uh, sometimes there's a PayPal account that uh, appears on a bank statement or in the, the books and records why does the association have a PayPal account and where is the, uh, the, the reports or the statements from that? Having multiple board members, you don't have to be a financial whiz, but you, just, you do have to satisfy your questions. And when what comes back is, I'm not showing them to you because you, you are impossibly stupid and you can't understand them even if I did show them to you. That's a huge red flag. Um, also, that's a, a horrible board culture. Yes, ma'am. So, what would you recommend is a good way to pay for a prior Most recently, our community did its annual block party. And I serve on the board, and so a lot of the expenses, because I do the community events, I pay for them out of pocket, and then we have uh, a neighborhood, I can't think of the name of the company that handles our, our business and mm -hmm. payments. They reimburse us mm -hmm. to send a receipt. And we have all the board members well, communi communicate through email to verify that this is an approved expense. So I just hear you talking about PayPal account. I didn't think that was an option, but what do you recommend as a safe, smart way to pay for items? Yeah, it's, it's kind of like um, with, with adoptions. So with, uh, I have a, this is kind of a strange analogy, but it's just what came to mind. So I have a very s narrow sliver of my practice where I practice uh, adoption law. Well, with adoptions, you have a child going from a parent to an adoptive parent. You have money changing hands, and under one set of statutes, that's a crime. Title 21 says trafficking in children is, is a crime. Title 10 says, here's the process where the adoption is perfectly legal. And it's the same thing with what you're describing. How, how can the association uh, transfer money to a board member legitimately versus what is embezzlement, uh, fraud, and a crime? And, and it's documentation. That's, that's the best way to do it. And the way we document, and this dovetails well into... <coughs> Uh, it's a different slide, but we'll get to it. So, if, if you know the expense is coming, having a board meeting and having minutes that the board has authorized you to spend that money, or if you've already spent the money, having the receipt and having the board discuss it, discuss it whether it's ahead of time or after the fact, you have... Um, you have a board meeting and then you have minutes reflecting that discussion. And you can be present for quorum purposes, but you don't vote. Don't ever record a vote where you're uh, approving the board to, to pay you money. All right? And so if you have, so if you have a three-member board, you sit out of that vote and the other two vote to approve it. All right? And then um, having a receipt. Um, I'm out of order now, but um, what that says, if you can read it, that says disinterested. So what I just explained, where you 
count for quorum purposes, but you sit out for the vote, that's called a disinterested uh, vote. And then having a receipt, and the receipt stays with the meeting minutes. So when that person next year goes on their witch hunt, and you're trying to uh, enforce the covenants or make them pay their dues, that's when that person gets really interested in how, uh, how to the letter of the law the board has followed the, uh, the covenants. That's when we got to have the receipts and the minutes because they're going to find, oh, what's this payment to her? What's this self-dealing that's going on? self-dealing we threw a block party here's the receipt the board approved it well I don't think the board should be uh, should be paying for that stuff okay now we're not talking about embezzlement now we're talking about discretion if you want to decide how the board spends the money whether it's on flowers or booze for the block party not that y'all not that y'all did that <laughs> I made that up <laughs> I'm, 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 I'm uh, talking about my favorite block party. Uh, <laughs> so um, th that's discretionary spending. That person needs to be on the board, right? So now we've protected ourselves. It's not that we're going to you know, not listen to that person, but we're just not going to listen to them very long. Because we're going to get to the point in the conversation, okay, are you alleging wrongdoing? Because there is no wrongdoing. Here's the documents. Here's the meeting minutes. Oh, what you're expressing is a difference of opinion? You have an opinion. Great. Thanks. Moving on. All right. Okay. Let's talk a little bit on, on these meeting tips. The, as a board member, uh, you know another thing that we should do is board longevity tests. So who has been a board member on your association for more than five years? Well, that didn't go how I thought it was. That is pretty good. All right, well, let me warn the, all of y'all. Um, <laughs> <laughs> There's this thing out there where you you feel like you're chained to the board. How long have you served on your board? Was it? It was uh, six years, and then I moved. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so you have to move, or your house has to burn down in order to to get out. It's it's kind of like church committees and things where once you're on, you are, you know, you're chained to the uh, uh, to the spot. That's not necessarily a bad thing. It means we've got continuity. It means at least there is enough you know, support that they don't want to throw you off or there's just so much apathy. They're like, I'm glad somebody else is doing it. Keep, keep doing it. But what will burn your batteries is spending a long time in meetings, feeling like you're spinning your wheels, you're not getting anywhere, and you may feel like this in your workplace. I hate spending time in meetings. It's just, you know, let's make a decision, let's all go to our separate rooms and then do our work, and let's get busy. The way you can mitigate some of that is by having an agenda. And if you're not using an agenda for your meetings, it may be because you haven't read your bylaws and you don't realize your bylaws require you to have an agenda, or maybe your bylaws don't require you to have one and you just should use one because it's good business practice. So one of the things that you could do, it's not the most exciting watching, but you could watch a either an Oklahoma City or uh, Edmond does a really good job of, of their meetings. And, and you can find one where um, if, if there's been reporting or something that you know is contentious and see how they handle contentious meetings or, or how they handle just regular meetings. And it's following the agenda. They don't get out of order. It's very systematic and, and business-like. And that's really what you're looking for. This isn't to suck the life out of your community association, but the life of your community association really isn't made at these meetings. What's made at these meetings are decisions and um, and resolutions. Yes, ma'am. Oh, you started to tell us what um, you would recommend or that you thought needed to be presented at a board meeting. We started out with the bank statements and then we, we got off on it. What else should be? Should we be presenting the financials to everybody and the well, that's that. What I said was um, the uh, the reconciled bank statements is the number one way to avoid embezzlement. In in terms of what what needs to be available at a board meeting, um, 
This is something too that goes along with the agenda and I'm, I'm glad, glad you asked that. There's this idea that the members participate in the board meeting and uh, I, I was town lawyer for this small town and they ran their meetings this same way and it was so frustrating. It made, made for very long meetings but everyone in the room, regardless of your position, thought they could talk from their chair and throw their two cents in. Well back in, you know, whenever, this is what we did. Well, who cares? I mean, you're, and I, I don't mean to be callous, and I definitely do not um, condone or want to promote board members with, we're, we're, we're in a, uh, an intimate gathering here, so we can be a little more loose with our, uh, our demeanor, I guess. But th we have to create an environment where members don't think that they're on the board and that they can talk out and, um, and disrupt the meeting. The purpose of the meeting is to go down the agenda for us to uh, not necessarily follow Robert's rules of order, but some form of order where board members can have a discussion, they can receive information from committee chairs or officers, they can have um, special sessions with lawyers where others aren't present because it's attorney-client privilege, they can get information from their, their town or city council person, and, and then the board can, as the agenda items uh, fall, make a motion, if it gets a second, have discussion, and then vote, right? There should be a portion on that agenda for member comments, but it's at the very end, and there should be very specific rules. Each member must stand up, come to the microphone or to the podium, and they have three minutes to say whatever they would like to say. We'll thank them when they're done. And then that's it. Yes, sir. One thing uh, that I've recommended to a lot of HOA boards is you don't just put it in an open forum area on your agenda that they have to request to kind of speak to the board prior to the board meeting. So, yeah, here, here's where, <clears throat> yeah, it's kind of an art and science. Right. And it really depends on the membership, it depends on the topic, and you, as a board, you don't want to seem like uh, that you're withholding information, that you're hiding anything. There really is nothing to hide. Members have full access to the books and records. Board members have absolute access to the books and records, unless perhaps the board member is suing other board members or the association, and that's kind of a weird, unusual situation. But it, there's no secret documents, there's no star chamber, there, there's none of that. Um, and sometimes boards foster that idea by not allowing members to sit in on board meetings. But if, if the idea is, well, if members who sit in on board meetings get to say whatever they want whenever they want, then I understand why they're excluded. And that's just, I think, a miscommunication and misunderstanding of how board meetings are supposed to work. <laughs> So providing, uh, I don't have a problem providing an open forum, but usually when you see that disappear from the agenda, it's because it's been abused. Right. And, that, and that's one of the things that we'll do. When it gets abused, okay, well open forum is now gone. Uh, you'll need to provide an agenda item prior to the meeting and then you'll be given time to, to speak. Yes, ma'am. What's your opinion about using a consent agenda? Uh, in a board meeting for purposes of just wrapping the financials and the minutes and everything in in order to save time. So a consent agenda is oh if if there's a list of things that you know the we need to pay a, B, C, and D items, they're routine, uh, do you approve them and, and the the board just approves them all at once instead of having individual conversation. That doesn't mean you can't, so if we have one through ten consent agenda items, I could say, you know, I need a little more information on nine, can we pull that from the consent agenda, find out a problem, and then we'll vote on it. Um, I, I think that's fantastic. And, and you see that too in municipal govern, government government, excuse me, uh, done very well. 
I've, I've served on a number of boards, and that just seems to work really well, and it's very efficient. If you if you if you provide the information, the consent agenda in advance to all the board members for them to read it, review it. You know, they're going to read it, review it, and it, it does. You put it at the front end, and you just kind of zip through it, and you don't get buried in that. You have to waste a lot of your effort and time. That's right. In that area. But the key to that is providing it in advance. And uh, a, a lot of boards, you know, you work full-time jobs, you have family time, you have leisure time, and then you have the time that you want to devote to your association board. And so that's really where, we don't talk much about management uh, throughout this. If you got questions, then, you know, we'll try. But I'm not a manager, Patrick's not a manager, but we do work managers there's a lot of overlap in what we do with management companies that's something that they could provide uh, should provide to boards but yeah consent consent agendas is the next step beyond prepare and follow an agenda uh, that's it's it's a, a great resource um, when you're open meeting act, can you expand on that a little bit yeah open meeting act absolutely does not apply to homeowners associations or condominium associations. And if you have a, a contingent or if you happen to find in your bylaws that somebody adopted a bylaw or a covenant that says the Open Meeting and Open Records Act apply to your association, quit immediately. Yeah. And yeah. Um, what about minutes? Because, well, minutes... Uh, it's, it's included in the minute. If if there was a well if it's included in a minute then that means the board or the members discussed it uh, possibly had a motion and approved that the open meeting act and open records act would apply mm -hmm. um, i would go back and and undo that i would take a second vote or s follow some pr process and the reason is uh, you're not compensated as a board member uh, you're not thanked very often. The last thing you want is criminal liability, and that's exactly what the Open Meeting and Open Records Act do. Uh, there are, v uh, it, 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 I'll, I'll give you a very small example. So, and by the way, they don't apply because associations are not public bodies. They're not public entities. Uh, the, the Open Meeting and Open Records Act are so that our government doesn't do things in secret and holds those entities to an extraordinarily high procedural standard so that we have ready access and push knowledge, not pull knowledge, of what our government's doing. And so, for example, under the Open Meeting Act, in order for... I mean, the, if you read the act, it, it's abundantly clear why it makes absolutely no sense for this, this setting, but um, you have to publish your ordinances. Well, your association doesn't have ordinances and it's not going to publish. You're immediately gonna be out of compliance with the Open Meeting Act. You have to give notice a year in advance of your regular meetings. And any special meeting that you have, the, the, the act's special meeting notice requirements is going to be nothing like what's in your bylaws. And so if you follow your bylaws in terms of special meeting notice, you're gonna violate the Open Meeting Act which is a crime in Oklahoma and, and uh, can su subject the board members to civil penalties. There's absolutely no reason why. So under, <clears throat> under our corporation code, the act that you want to look at for access to records beyond what your bylaws provide is section 1065. We have pretty good case law in Oklahoma in terms of shareholder uh, or member, in y'all's case, access to the books and records. And unless it's confidential, unless there's some kind of financial privacy, members, all they have to do is have a proper form, which basically means under oath, and state a, a proper purpose. And the proper purpose can be board members you know what, I'm gonna do uh, everything I can to find all the dirt on you board members in the books and records so that I can convince others to throw you off the board. And, and y'all are thinking, is it my birthday? Uh, but, but sometimes, sometimes boards, they, you get really defensive 
and I, I would too. When people threaten me, I tend to get defensive. You don't have to with books and records. Uh, the answer is never no, even to that one person, that one guy, that th there's no obnoxious exception uh, to the, the books and records access. Even that guy gets access to them. What consists of records? So that's a good question, and that's the, the, the fight areas for this are what are records, how quickly do we have to get them, do you have to pay for them? So our question was, well, what are records? Emails among board members, definitely records. Text messages among board members, records. Um, by the way, if you have a board distribution or email chain, you might not just be having communications among board members, you might actually be having meetings, which may not be a bad thing as long as y'all understand, okay, folks, we're circulating an email because we don't have another regular meeting. Does everyone consent to this serving as our, our meeting and, and our vote? And then what you do is you take your vote, and if everyone says, absolutely, we don't need to get into a room together, then at your very next in the room together meeting, you paper that up. That's an agenda item. Okay, you just approve that. So uh, that would be a record. My individual notes of, of a meeting, those are not records, typically. Um, unless I am writing up my committee report that I deliver and it's, it's an outline of my committee report and I attach it to or I give it to the secretary to serve as my written report, now we have a record. But individual board member impressions, notes, those are going to be discoverable, meaning if there's litigation, uh, an attorney probably could get their hands on them, but it's probably not a book and record that a member would have access to. Um, that's typically the big areas. I, as counsel for association, particularly when it gets into litigation or they ask for all of the emails and texts, I, I'll have to tell you, I cringe. I mean, the stuff, the stuff people put on social media is astounding enough. Uh, and the, and, and that's public. I mean, you, at some level, you know everyone sees this. The stuff that board members put in emails and text messages, I, I cringe because it's going to be an exhibit. And so here, here is the, the caution, the warning. Before you hit send, and I have to do the same thing. I, I have that guy and that gal in my life as well. They're usually lawyers, but <laughs> I have to hit delete after I type out everything that I want to say or I'll show my phone to my wife, hey, is this inappropriate? Yeah, delete it. So, you know, get, get a second set of eyes, let a, an evening uh, go by before you hit send on that scorcher of an email that you know will just fix them. Because it, it comes back as an exhibit and we have to explain it. Yes? I got one bit of advice that I think that you probably already mentioned in that other, earlier seminar is if you guys are using your emails, family email, uh, personal email address for a board uh, information, stop. You need to create a specific separate email address and only use that for your, your um, uh, correspondence because everything's discoverable, right? I mean, That's if right. you're using my, if I'm using my personal family, I'm emailing my mom or my whatever, you know, uh, everything's discoverable. But if you separate that and only, hey, it's forward information, separate that and use to create an email account or whatever that's easy. That, that's right on target and really good advice. Um, and it's, it's fairly easy. So if your association has its own domain, you can go in and set up a distribution email, board at happyacres.org. Uh, even if you don't, you can get um, happyacresboard at gmail.com, uh, and that can be the distribution to your home, right? So that you, you have one email for the entire board. It's also a, a convenience for your vendors and your, your lawyer, your members, that they don't have to track down individual board members. They can just send it to president at whatever. 
Uh, it's pretty handy with that technology. Yes, ma'am. Hold on, just a second. Yes, ma'am. So if you have a board president who emails and texts very inappropriate comments to people who live in the association, when they reach out to him, what kind of trouble could he get into? <laughs> All right. I, I don't want to to scare anyone uh, unduly. I, so, and this goes this goes for the the um, in person meetings as well. I just did the research on a f it's it's been a couple of years now on whether certain sections of the have you. Have, We'll talk about this later, but the uh, the Fair Housing Act prohibits discrimination in the offering, the sale of housing. Uh, have, have you read any of that hostile environment stuff? Yeah. I mean, you talk about almost the rest of my hair falling out. It's it scared me, and I've lived long enough that not a whole lot scares me anymore. But there are standards out there where. Um, associations can be held liable for hostile environment which we typically think of in a workplace so uh, the office screamer goes into the office sexual harasser and the employer doesn't adequately handle that situation and the employer can be liable uh, there are instances where the association can also be liable in that so it's it's not a situation I mean apart from it's inappropriate I mean um, it, it's not it's not the environment anymore for condo and associations where it's inappropriate and it's not treating your neighbor the way you would want to be treated. Um, is this a male that's doing this? Yes. So um, I don't know if he has daughters or not or if he's married, but he, he wouldn't speak to them that way. Um, it, it's also against the law. And um, the, uh, the association needs to take appropriate steps. now. That's the trouble, and that's what scared me is what what are the appropriate steps in that situation and and something doing something um, is is the first step so um, so the answer is th there are significant things that could happen um, I mean apart from a victim's protection order, if this individual is sending uh, electronic email or electronic messages whether social media text messages or emails uh, at a after a certain point that could be a federal and a state crime if he's making threats if he's um, singling someone out because of an uh, an impermissible reason gender being one of them uh, race country of origin um, I mean, th these are things as a society that um, we, we don't need laws to tell us not to do them, but we do have laws that tell us not to do them and they carry significant penalties. Um, <clears throat> which dovetails nicely into the, look, board members, we, we have to model the behavior that we want to see come back to us from the members. Uh, I've been in meetings where the president is screaming from the board table and it's no surprise that meeting got out of hand very quickly. Uh, you know, there is a way, uh, a very age old way of treating people that you disagree with, with honor and respect and hammering out the disagreement even if you don't come to the conclusion where you agree. And unfortunately, a lot of us have been fed the lie that peace means that we agree on everything. And that, that is not what peace is. Peace is agreeing to argue with uh, holding each other by the elbows as opposed to strangling each other by the throat. Okay? And in order to do that, we have to be in the room together oftentimes. So boards, one of the best things that you can do. It's not just providing information, but it's also providing an example and a path for members how, how to talk to their neighbor, because you're going to get this. Raise your hand if you've, if you've received the call or the email, my neighbor's dog is driving me crazy, or my neighbor's parked in front of my mailbox, or blah, blah, blah. Go do something about it. You know, well, 
show me where my sheriff's badge is and I'll get right on it. You know, that's, that's not the board's responsibility to police the neighborhood. It is a really good opportunity to get that person and to coach them and teach them how to go to their neighbor and how to resolve conflict themselves. That's, that's, they should have been taught it in civics class or their parents or whatever, but for some reason a lot of us didn't get that. And that is a huge function that your board can, can provide. Yes. Uh, your first thing about annual meetings, uh, our bylaws specify directly how each homeowner is supposed to get uh, the, the meeting uh, by, by mail. And our past president decided to save a lot of money by just hanging them out. And I'm worried that the annual meeting is not legal. So th that, and that's a good example. Uh, you can save postage by uh, not putting postage on it and just sticking, sticking it in somebody's mailbox. And that's a pretty common thing. And that may go along great. People may thank you for not you know, wasting money on postage until that guy gets kicked up and then he's gonna call the postmaster who's gonna say, I've heard this before regarding homeowner associations, I'm not gonna get involved but that person will have found a federal crime. You can't put stuff in a mailbox without postage. It's a crime. Uh, and they are gonna wave that around. You see our board, I knew it, they were uh, involved in wrongdoing. So what needs to happen there is uh, simply have the board, th this is tougher in a, in a condo setting because in a condo setting the bylaws require a vote of the membership in order to amend them. If it's regular corporate bylaws, most of the time, and this is where you can't take this as, as legal advice because invariably someone says, well the lawyer said in an HOA we can amend the bylaws so that's what we did. Well, oftentimes a board can unilaterally amend the bylaws in an HOA. Uh, definitely not in a condo, it takes the vote of the membership, but in an HOA you can. So usually what you'll do is, if you can do that, you'll just take that, that burdensome or onerous language out and say you can give notice by mail, by electronic mail, by posting, by hand delivery, and you just expand it. Is, is the decisions made during that annual meeting <coughs> valid now? Um, th that is a very long answer okay. and it depends on the facts. Okay. So if that guy who is claiming, well I caught you and so now everything that the board has done is now void, uh, that's, they may not be wrong on some things, but if that person didn't register their, uh, their complaint at that meeting or their objection, some courts will determine that they've waived that objection. Uh, there, there are a lot of facts that go into that. How about the quorum? So a quorum, um, <clears throat> so oh, I'm sorry. No, we, I need to move along anyway. So a, a quorum is the minimum number of people that you need in the room in order to conduct business and that applies both for the board and the membership. It may be if you look at what your bylaws require for quorum purposes and you look at your annual meetings, you've never had a quorum. That is very common. Now it may be, hopefully, that your bylaws pr provide a, a little trick with the notice that allows you to get a quorum. So some bylaws will, will provide that um, after due notice a quorum must be present and a quorum consists of one third of the members in person or by proxy. And if, if and this is, would be the bylaw, bylaw language, uh, if a quorum is not present at that time, then that meeting may be adjourned, notice given, and at the next meeting a quorum will be deemed present. Right? Well, you can actually do that with, with one notice as opposed to two. The first notice that goes out, you say, hey, we're having a meeting on such and such date. If at 7 o'clock, if at 7.05 a quorum is not present, we will adjourn and we will have our uh, second meeting at 7.10 the exact same night. So you look for opportunities with your notice 
to get your, get your adjourned meeting quorum. If your bylaws are just handcuffs, then we're back to what we were talking about and seeing if we can amend that language. Uh, it is entirely possible that uh, your articles of incorporation prohibit the board from amending the bylaws and that would be the, the, the time when your board could not unilaterally amend. Uh, if you look at Oklahoma law, it says unless prohibited by the articles of incorporation, the board may amend the bylaws unilaterally. You can send it to a vote of the membership. Uh, in fact, I'm, I want you to look at that on your own. That's Title 18, Section 1013. That's that's a uh, the board bylaw amendment statute. Section 1013. Yes, sir. Yeah. Um, in this one slide, you you talk about governing body. Yes. Definition, please. Governing body is the board. So in, in that slide, you're probably looking at, is it referencing to section 1065? Uh, uh, it doesn't have a section. doesn't have a section. It's a, a, a procedure and rules. Okay. Governing body would be the board, and shareholder would be the, the individual member. So in certain places, uh, 1065 being one of them, it talks about shareholder, uh, Obviously, y'all y'all don't hold shares. It's uh, a non-stock company by definition. But what 1065 says is shareholder also refers to member of the corporation. So in the in Title 18, the Corporation Act, if you come across governing body, it's talking about your board of directors or officers, and then shareholder is a member. And, and so you were saying that if it's in the CCs that we have to have a quorum a certain amount, then we can't, the governing body can't. Art, uh, what I was saying is the Articles of Incorporation prohibit the board. If, if you read Section 10, 1013, uh -huh. it says unless the Articles of Incorporation prohibit the board from amending the bylaws, then the board can do it. But your question, you didn't ask this, but it raises a very common thing. So. We've got our declaration and we have our bylaws. If you're a mandatory association, there's going to be a section that uh, the, dec the declarant or the developer declares for himself or herself and all of the lot owners that they shall pay dues to the association. And it's going to talk about how often, how much, and then how to change them. In that how to change them, there may be a quorum provision. And then you also look in your bylaws and you also have a quorum provision. So now what happens? Yeah. Well, oftentimes this quorum provision says two-thirds. And then this one might say one-third. Well, now we have a conflict. We've got some crunch in our contracts. Maybe, maybe not. And this is where reading the language and not just saying, well, okay, we have a quorum clause in our declaration, so we have to follow that. Well. Maybe, maybe not. If you read that and it says, for any meeting for the purpose of increasing the assessments, there shall be a quorum of two-thirds. Well, we have a quorum provision specifically for a certain type of meeting, and that's assessment uh, increase. And then this one's probably a general. Unfortunately, those old covenants that we talked about, they, they may simply say, at any meeting of the members, a quorum shall be present and it shall be two-thirds. Well, now what do we do? We've got two conflicting, and most associations are going to want to go with the easier one, right? Maybe you can do that, maybe not. It's fairly common to have another, um, another clause in our bylaws that's a conflicts clause. And it, what it says is, if there's a conflict between the declaration and the bylaws, the declaration controls. So if we do have a conflict between our quorum provisions, and we do have that conflicts clause in there, then we, we've got to go with the declaration quorum provision. Does the non-for-profit statute in Oklahoma dictate quorum? Uh, it does, but it's, uh, it's an unless otherwise provided. Yeah, that's a... So, so you, you're saying the quorum is specified by the bylaws in the declaration? Of, oftentimes it's specified in the bylaws because quorum is a corporate voting thing. 
It's a corporate governance thing. It's not uncommon, though, in certain sets of covenants to find a quorum clause in, in the covenants as well, which is a problem. We're going to talk about amendments at some point, and if if as you go through your governing documents you find conflicts like this, then put that on the list to change. Uh, if, you, if you find assessment language in your bylaws, put that on the list to move it to your, your covenants because covenants are the document that should address assessments and the bylaws should deal with the business of the business. Meetings, notice, board, office, all of that. Uh, this answers somebody's question about, well, what about the non Nonprofit Act? We don't have a Nonprofit Act. We did in the 70s. It went away in the 80s. We just have the General Corporations Act. And what it says is, unless otherwise provided, uh, and, and that's what that UOP, it, unless there is something else in the governing documents that applies, the default quorum is one-third for Oklahoma corporations. By the way, this is another good reason to incorporate, is you get some really good default language. If if you're unincorporated in your declaration, you probably don't have bylaws, but you could, and they don't answer some of these questions, what's our quorum? How many people do we have to have in a room in order to do business? I don't know. You could just make it up, I guess, because we don't have any default. <laughs> what they would do is they would adopt some bylaws that answers those questions, but uh, we don't need to get in that, that situation. How much time we got? Not much. Ten minutes. All right. Whoops, I'm going the wrong way. Let's talk about proxies. So one, one good way to get our quorum is to use proxies. Uh, if if some, one of your members says, our bylaws don't authorize proxies, so you can't use them, they're illegal. They're absolutely wrong. A proxy is simply a document that authorizes another person to go to that meeting so I don't have to sit through another association meeting. Um, there, there are also, provisions in the law, and I cite them here, that um, unless the, the proxy provides otherwise, it expires after a period of time. If you execute a proxy, you can undo that. Uh, it just takes the same formality that you executed the proxy and the same kind of notice. So if I signed a proxy and I delivered it to the Secretary of the Association, a document, a letter, given to the secretary that says I revoke or I undo or, or withdraw my proxy is the same formality and that would work. What about timing on proxies? Do you have to do it in advance? you hold them through the meeting? What? Sorry. Um, the, the question was what kind of advance notice on through the meeting, do you have to turn it in? Yes. Typically what you'll do, because uh, you have to count quorum in order to know whether you're having a, a voting meeting or just an information meeting, at the sign-in, uh, say I come in with five proxies, uh, I'll come in, I'll sign in for my myself, and then I'll designate next to each of those people, if we're using a sign-in sheet, that I'm signing in um, as their proxy. And then it, that's another aspect of proxies. Is it a directed proxy? Is it a voting proxy? So I could give my proxy just a, a blank slate. Uh, I want you present for quorum and voting purposes and you just vote however you think I would vote. And uh, that's the, I said blank slate, blank check. So I could do a directed one. Uh, I don't care what business comes before the meeting. I want you to vote on these, these, this agenda item, and this is the way I want you to vote. That's a directed proxy. Sometimes associations will send out proxies that uh, vote yes on this issue, vote no on that issue. And um, that's oftentimes how we will get uh, bylaws and covenants amended is by using proxies that, that um, have that language. And they be used again in the next Typically, yes. So if, if I give you a proxy that says uh, this proxy is good for the next five years and all the meetings occurring in that time, then you've, I have designated the period of time. The law says uh, it, it, unless otherwise provided, it'll expire after three years. Um, there are some 
I, I've seen this, and I think it was from a management company. The proxy that they used said um, it was for a specific meeting date. Well, why would you do that? Because if you don't have your quorum, you're going to have to adjourn the meeting and, and redo quorum. You're going to have to send out proxies again. And all the proxies that people sent back expire on that date. Uh, and I think it was just not thinking through what this language means and reusing forms. And um, OK, so we've got about five minutes. Let's talk. Yes, ma'am. What is the newspaper rule? <laughs> the newspaper rule, um, uh, call it uh, your mom, the, the mom rule or whatever, but don't write anything that you wouldn't want to see on the front page of the newspaper the next day. <laughs> yes, ma'am. I know you said we would be talking about it a minute later, but my question was, as far as you kind of brought it, you touched on it just a moment, about the Airbnb. Yes. And I'm wondering if you wanted to amend that rule in your bylaws, does it have to be, can it be done by just the board members, or does it have to be a majority rule? That, that's a, a good introduction to, to the amendment topic, and we're, we're on it right now, and I'll spend a couple of minutes on it. Um, the, the quick answer is it really depends. <laughs> so we already talked about bylaws, and we know it doesn't depend uh, if we're a condominium. If we're a condominium and we have bylaws, it takes a vote of the membership. The board cannot unilaterally amend bylaws in condo. It may also require the vote of our mortgage companies who have lent money on condo units. That's a really high, high burden. Um, if, if we're talking about covenants, almost always it takes a vote of the membership. And so conceptually we need to think covenants always require a vote of the membership, almost never can the board unilaterally amend covenants because it is, it's such a fundamental document you need to think of it in terms of like our, our constitutions. It, it is an extraordinary act to change the language in this. The, the, the rights, the responsibilities are so fundamental that we can't change them willy-nilly. Bylaws, we can change those because we're not talking about real property interests, we're talking about the business of the business. Right? And there's a built-in safety net. If the board comes in and unilaterally amends the bylaws and we don't like that, we throw them off the board and we, we, we take over the board and we put the language in our bylaws the way we want. All right? You've got that built-in safety net. Um, don't have that with covenants. Okay, so we're gonna, I'm going to show you a slide. We're going to talk just a little bit about amendments and we'll pick up the conversation um, next week. So I'm going to show you this slide, I'm going to let you read it, and this helps explain why sometimes we need to amend our, our covenants. This is actual, uh, I'll, I'll go ahead and set it up too. So this is actual covenant language. I've reproduced it word for word and punctuation mark by punctuation mark, okay? All right, so just soak in all of its horribleness <laughs> just for a second. <laughs> <laughs> it never gets old. It's still good. It's still good 15 years. <laughs> I know. I haven't changed the slide. It's still funny. Um, so, there are a number of interpretations that we could get from this language. Some of them incredibly un PC uh, or, or rude. Does anybody know what this is talking about? Okay. Did you say duck hunting? Yeah. yeah this is actually an attempt at a, a sportsman's uh, covenant where it's unsportsmanlike to, to shoot birds on the ground, whether you're uh, dove hunting, duck hunting, and that's where the cripples comes from. It's talking about the duck. It's not talking about people. <laughs> so so there's, there's that level. But even when we know what they were trying to do, it's still horrible. 
So can I shoot crippled ducks when my boat is running backwards? Because it just says the boat shall not be in forward motion. Do I get an exemption if I'm going backwards? Then I can shoot anything I want. Yeah. Yeah. Running underline. Yeah, when in your drafting, anytime you have to underline and I'm not sure what the what the, the single quotes is, this is just bad, right? <laughs> So th this, this is a, a funny example of sometimes we come across language that it's just terrible. It doesn't mean anything. It doesn't work. It's clunky. Uh, if you have a set of covenants that hopefully were not filed in the last decade, but I still see new covenants contain this, but if they were filed prior to the 90s, uh, it probably has a satellite dish clause in there, even though since 1996 this language has been illegal that says no satellite dishes shall be visible from the street. Absolutely unenforceable under federal law. <laughs> Cannot enforce that. Um, but yet, somebody's got a form and all these things mean the same thing, so we'll just sign at the bottom and file them and this is what you get. Uh, so whether it's... Can we draw it We've got that problem. Well, you can, and then that person files an FCC complaint, and the FCC assesses civil penalties against the association. That, that's one, one possibility. So, um, but then again, it also depends. If that person sticks that satellite dish on a general common element outside their condo unit, absolutely the association can tell them to take it down. Just like I can tell my neighbor to quit parking his truck in my driveway. You know, it's my property. Same thing with the general common elements for condominium associations. Now, if it's a limited common element, so um, I'm going to go over time a little bit, just because, like I said, this is one of my favorite things to do. Uh, if you need to leave, go right ahead. But we'll we'll pick this up again next next week. But on a condo, so on a condominium, <laughs> you've got different slices of of airspace and improvements. <coughs> and I'm not going to claim to be an artist. Um, and then... So this is our condominium building. And these are stacked on top to make them a condo. No, no. Um, actually, you don't have to have uh, anything stacked on top. Although, if you read Oklahoma's Condo Act, this is the idea that you're going to get because in the '60s, this is what condos look like. No, our condos in Oklahoma can look just like this, where you know you've got standalone uh, condominium. Uh, you can have you can have duplexes. You can have du duplexes be a condo or not a condo. See, a condo is a form of ownership. It's not a structure. So I could condo this room. I could condo uh, your tables and your chairs. By the way, and this is random, but in Oklahoma we still have a, a church seat easement. Uh, I, I, could, I could reserve you a, a uh, legally enforceable seat in church. <laughs> By statute. Um, yeah. So, so anyway, where I was going with this was in, in a condominium you have things called general common elements limited common elements, and then you have units. <clears throat> the unit is the airspace, possibly the, the finishes, the paint, possibly the jip board that's behind it or the, the cement. It really just depends on what the declaration defines as unit. And then beyond that, you've got general common element, and the general common element is stuff that everybody gets to use and everybody owns in a, a fractional percentage. And that's typically roof, foundation, support walls, doors, 
I uh, sure hope your declaration if you're a condo defines who owns the windows and who pays for broken glass because that's a big one. Elevator. The elevator. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and then, so those are all general common elements. And then we have limited common elements. And so limited common elements sometimes could be parking spaces, uh, could be balconies. And this gets us back to the satellite dish. So if, if this is my unit, and I decide, you know what, I get really good reception by putting my satellite dish on the roof. Uh, the associate, and that roof is a general common element. The association can demand without any fear of the FCC to remove that. Now, it gets a little more tricky if I put it in my limited common element and generally the association cannot have me remove that even though it sticks out and you can see it from the street. And that's even if you have a covenant that says no, no satellite dish is visible from the street. And there's all kinds of convulsions of, well, uh, what, if, what if we have that covenant that says you can't see it from the street and we don't tell them you've got to get rid of it, but we tell them, well, you've got to paint it to match the roof. Or you've got to move it such... No. That's not a, not a winner of a case. So if we have a plaque, then we're considered HOA. Uh, not necessarily because uh, this condo could be built on lot one and so there could be a lot. The only thing is the, the condo development is going to have a legal description of lot one, block one, and then it's going to refer to the, the declaration. It's the declaration that actually creates a condo, not whether it's platted. Yes, sir. What happens along the lines of the, of the satellite dish? What happens if you have a restriction on putting signs and windows in, the, in a condo? Can, can that be? <clears throat> That's a, a really good question. And um, if if it's on the exterior, absolutely yes. So it's not uncommon. In fact, the form of covenants that I use, it talks about whatever goes on inside a unit or inside a house, as long as there's no noise, sound, uh, or noise, smell, uh, no indicia of whatever's going on outside, then that's fine. Now, if there's uh, signs in the windows, it really just depends on what we're talking about, too. If we're talking about political speech, then that's going to be a fight. If it's uh, a Van Halen poster, uh, then that's going to be a fight. That's uh, personal expression, and that's no different in, in some people's minds, and you'll have to convince a judge whether that, that steps over you know, planting petunias versus lilies. If it's, and, and the, the cases that you see these, I, I can't think of a sign case. I'm thinking. In Missouri, we have one. It's a case law that exactly what he said. Oh, really? Yeah, it was a filed, uh, it was uh, passed a couple of years ago. What was the sign? It was a political sign. Someone wanted to vote for a local uh, you know, judge or something. And this is a statute that was passed or yeah. mm -hmm. allowing it or disallowing it? Allowing it. it. Yeah. So, so the agent did not prevent a political sign. Uh, it gave them uh, rules like so many days prior and so many days after the election. Yeah. But you can't, you can't, in Missouri, you, you have to allow that. So pretty much that framework is what I have in, that, that's the, the framework that I put in my covenants. But if we're talking about something other than political speech, and I think the question too is, uh, is, is that what the association board wants to be in the business of is, you know, so next summer or maybe this summer when Oklahoma decides, you know what, it's really not medical marijuana, it's just recreational stuff and we're going to adopt a law to adopt recreational marijuana and all the signs go in the yards. Well, that, that's a legitimate uh, referendum. I, I assume it will be a referendum. And a, if you have a board that has, and I'm not taking a position one way or another, I'm just using this because it's a really good example. Um, because some people have strong moral feelings about medical marijuana, recreational marijuana, and uh, I, I anticipate having board members ask, look, can we ban pot leaf signs in people's yards? 
And my question is, well, um, do you want to ban OSU flags versus OU flags? Do you want to ban uh, invite your neighbor to church signs? You know, and, and, and again, I'm not taking a position on any one of those, but those are pretty common too. They're not a political statement. Uh, they're a religious statement. You know, invite a friend to church today. Where does the board want to step into uh, the discussion? And, you know, most of those things will resolve themselves, particularly if they're campaigns. But that's the answer to the question, I think, depends on whether it's commercial speech. So if I put a law office sign on the exterior of my house or in my window, I don't think I can enforce that one. I'll probably lose. I would think that I would if I tried to keep that up because it's commercial speech. If it's political speech, um, I would assume that we'd win that one. And if it's hate speech, uh, I would assume that that would lose. And so it, it kind of depends on what kind of speech that we're talking about. What about American flag in your yard? Um, Section 858. Yep. As long as you're displaying it according to the U.S. flag code, you abs the association, neighbor, no one can can bar that. Now, yep. now the fight area of that is, and I've got some great pictures of neighbor disputes. Yeah. They're they're coming next week, so that that's your teaser. You have you have to come back. But the the fight area is okay. You you cannot prohibit the flag, but the flag just doesn't hang out there by itself. What if I have, you know, the whole, uh, my wife and I went to Gilcrease this morning, so this is on my, my mind. What if I have the, the whole Iwo Jima, you know, those guys. What if I have that recreated on my front lawn? Uh, and, and, What's that? Out of mufflers. Out of mufflers? Yeah. yeah. Uh, that, that would get litigated in a court. Of course, a court's going to have to decide, well, is that exactly what portion of this? And Can, can the HOAs tell you to put the flag on your house instead of in your yard? Yeah, I've seen that happen uh, where they had to take it out of their yard, but they just put it in the fence hole. So it was still there. It just was what um, the flag hole. I mean, the, the, the question, can they do that, uh, let me answer it this way. Is that a case that I would stand in front of a, ju a, a judge and argue? The answer is no. Okay. And, and, you know, that's, lawyers can't tell you whether they're going to win a case or not. If a lawyer tells you, oh, yeah, you're going to win this case, you need to fire them because they're lying to you. They, they, we have absolutely no idea whether you're going to win a case. Uh, what I can do is determine, as, as an attorney, as who I am, do I want to stand in front of a judge? Do I want to be known for arguing this side of the case? And there are close cases, and there are some cases that you take that are, are distasteful, but you do that for a principle. But uh, this goes back to our sign discussion. Why, why is the association making the decision you can't have a flagpole in your yard, but it's okay to, to have it on your house? I mean, what's, what's, yeah. the, what's the point? And a lot of times what I find in those kinds of disputes is what I have is some, someone or multiple, multiple people on the board that it's not about the, um, the actual issue, it's about some kind of personality. Oh, yeah. You know, this, this person, whether it's a personal thing or it's something that's very strong and I understand it is, well, this person thumbs their nose, they need to be made an example of, you know, really? Is that the purpose of our association, is, is punishment? You know, it's, it's promotion of community. Yes, ma'am. You're talking about signs. What if the HOA also has rules in addition to bylaws? And the rules say they're signs. So, the policy, I guess. Yeah, so the, when, when a developer hires me, uh, I come in after the plat and I draft the declaration and I attach a number of things to the declaration, the bylaws being one. I also attach rules, and then I also attach, um, well, we'll just call them, that's a G, uh, design guidelines. Okay. This is almost six and one half dozen the other. 
So in some association or in some neighborhood covenants, what you'll see is all of the thou shalt's and thou shalt nots set out up here. Uh, I, I use the declaration more as a framework and then I use the thou shalt nots and shalls and the rules dealing with covenant or dealing with the use of, of property. Um, can I use my property for short, short term rentals? Um, you, you can't have uh, excessive noise, rubbish, all that stuff. I put all of those kinds of rules in the rules. Uh, what the design looks like, square footage, sunrooms, all the structural restrictions, I put in DRGs. But it's not uncommon to take all of these and you've just got them all, all up here. Okay, but our rules say you can't have any political signs. You can't have what? Political so that's something uh, that what she said was they have rules that say no political signs. Uh, are those rules a attached to the covenants? Are they filed of record, or is this something that somebody came up with? That yeah, I, I think the way I'll answer that is the board should consider why that rule was adopted and whether if uh, whether that rule is enforceable if somebody wants to put a political sign in their yard yeah okay thank you guys thanks for giving me a little bit more time and we'll pick it back up next week thank you